to go see it because even being part of the filming, I didn't know, I didn't have the script. I wasn't sure how they were gonna do the acting part of it. You know, we were doing all the driving stuff, but you we were just sitting in cars, so, you know, how much, even, even the stuff that was with the actors, you know, they're saying action, but we're just driving by. I have no idea what they're even saying. <laughs> so it was, it, was, it was just as, I guess, you know, new to me to watch it, you know? We, I knew what driving was when it come up. I go, oh yeah, I remember that. But I had, you know, it was great to, to actually go see it. Did you go to the premiere? Yeah. Today? Yeah, and there was a couple. We ended up doing one for the stunt guys, um, which was great. Alex Gurney and his family and, and the movie set up one down in LA, which is super fun. We had like all kinds of like Jimmy Vassar race car drivers and, and Townsend Bell and everybody showed up and super fun because we had the whole theater and we're and Alex Gurney had a, a pointer hitting the screen. There I am, there I am. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. This was just conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, no, we haven't started yet. We got we got popcorn over here. <laughs> I should rattle that. Yeah. Or crunch it. So how, how are we are we starting yet? Start, okay. Yep. Good. You're the sun man. You were mentioning that you, 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 you saw the movie with the, a lot of drivers. The dri how do you feel that the drivers community uh, feel about the movie? I think uh, I think there's two sides to the, the driver, like racing drivers and drivers and people with racing enthusiasts um, viewed the movie. Uh, some of it is looking at the actual driving part of the movie. Um, there's some stuff just because of the way they had to film it, you know, isn't just like racing. Um, I can tell you truly from doing the movie, being in part of the stunts, we were at high rates of speed for cars that weren't ra real race cars. Um, we were definitely in situations that were technically dangerous. But I think uh, most people that enjoy the history and the background of racing and the stories that go behind it, I, I think most of them had a positive outlook on that story. I think it, 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 the film captured that for sure. Um, but then um, there will always be people that have something that they don't like. But I would say majority, I think, really liked it. You were driving super performance uh, replicas. I mean, so they're pretty darn close to the real thing. Um, how do they compare with maybe a classic race car, the real thing, mm -hmm. and a new car? I mean, was this actually somewhat dangerous to be playing with a, a modern vintage car? Yeah, well, so there was only two of the super performance actual uh, cars, and so they were used in some of the scenes, well, they were used in more of the scenes that they were doing some of the inside, looking out of the car because of course it has all the gauges. We had another company that built some of the GT40s that those cars had no gauges, meaning we didn't have even tachometers or anything to know. We'd have to hear the revs to shift the next gear, which did, came fairly natural because just from all the years of racing. Um, so the Super Performance cars fell, I would say, in between a, a complete full-blown race car and an older vintage car because the technology just wasn't that great back then. They, they knew how to make horsepower, but braking and turning wasn't really the greatest because of even tires, you know, weren't nearly as good as they are today. So I would say the super performance cars were quite amazing. The other cars we had were good, but not as nearly as good as the super performance uh, those GTs. Those were the hero cars, Correct. and those were the, the other race cars. Yeah, and you saw more of those in the background and things. Um, or if they didn't, like for instance, my dad's car, which was the number five GT40, um, would, never had a scene from the inside out. So it was one of the other cars, which I, I drove a lot which when we first got them, they were horrible because they didn't even have a setup on them. Some of the cars would hit, when you hit the brakes, it'd pull to the right or pull to the left. So it took about a, about a week to get the full setup on the cars before they felt, you know, like they weren't trying to kill us. Yeah. <laughs> you, you play your dad, I mean, you drove the same car that, that he drove that, uh, back then. Yes, yeah. correct. Yeah, I, the funny thing was, I actually got the phone call <clears throat> kind of late into the, 
project. Um, Robert Nagel, who's the stunt coordinator that put everyone together, had first hired Tanner Faust to be, to play the role of my dad, Ronnie Bucknam. Um, and then I got a call um, from Rich Rutherford, who's another stunt driver um, who's been in the Hollywood industry for a long time. Um, once they uh, talked about having me be the, to come in and do some of the stunt driving. So since they'd already um, put Tanner as, and um, James Mangold, the main director, had already hired him to be, they, I didn't get technically the role of my dad. Um, there were two, I think, lines that were, my dad had uh, in, the, in the movie. They didn't make the final cut, um, but Robert Nego was so gracious to, even Tanner Faust, I have to say, he made, he, he made sure that I did all the driving in my dad's car. So when it came to the speaking, he had to do it. And he was like, I want you to do it. But ultimately, um, it was the director's decision. So I, yes, I got to do all the driving in my dad's car. Plus, I drove at least six other cars in the movie, um, mainly because my dad's car doesn't really show up till the end, because that's part of the one, two, three finish. So they had us drive just pretty much all the cars throughout the whole movie. But it was not related hiring you. I mean, they, they didn't see you, or they didn't know you were your year. No, they did. Saw, okay. They did. It, um, I was an afterthought. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but yes, um, I, th I think it's because, so Robert Nagel is a stunt coordinator. We had never met, but Rich Rutherford is a, f a friend of mine that I'd known for 20, 30 years in the racing industry, and he brought it to Robert's attention. He said, hey, we can bring in Ronnie Bucknam's son to drive it, and he goes, absolutely. Give him a call. So that's how I, that's how I got to. Have you done a stunt driving for movies before, or is the first time you've done it? I did like two commercials, um, very little. Like compared to what we did for six months of driving, it was. I would almost say no, but I, I did do a couple of commercials. But this was a whole nother level of of uh, driving, stunt driving, and being a part of the whole film crew was was amazing. So yeah. how did it feel in those moments? where you were recreating that finish when you were in that car yeah. and then seeing yourself on screen recreating your dad. How did that yeah. feel? I mean, not many people get to do, to be in the same shoes or seat yeah. as their father. Yeah, I think that was the moment, you, know, you what you just brought up, because we did a lot of driving and that just felt like my racing. It didn't really feel like I was um, part of my dad's history or driving his car. When you're sitting in a car, you don't know what the car is you're just sitting at the driver's seat when we did the finishing scene and I, I always tell a funny story of course in the real race in 1966 my dad finishes third even in photos that are real he's the third car in the back when we did the finish scene I told all the stunt guys I'm gonna gas it and I'm gonna take first on the first cut <laughs> so when they said action action as we got close to the line I gassed it and I I won <laughs> the, the, the directors all cut Cut, cut, you, no, you, Bucknam, you get third, not first. So that was actually, we filmed it, we have it, I have it on my, my phone. Um, but having that moment, even when you pull up and stop and, and get out and everybody's like the fans, the way we did it in the movie, the same way they do, you know, really at Le Mans, when you finish, you come across the line and there's so many people. Um, yeah, that was pretty emotional to know that you're a part of that history. And I kept looking back at the original pictures, I'd find them as we were doing the filming to see how they came across the line and what it looked like. I believe your father is somewhere. He, he's passed, passed away, yep, yeah, um, many years ago. Your, your father was the first person to race a Honda. Correct. And that was in Formula One. Correct. And he also raced a GT40. Correct. And I just wonder if you, both of those uh, draw to the present, um, I wonder how he would fast forward and what reflections he would have about the industrialization of racing. You know, they didn't even have sponsors back then. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. What, what do you imagine? <coughs> Yeah, I think, uh, well, I think one of the things that he would know that even, say, for instance, the Formula One car, um, that the first Formula One car <coughs> for Honda um, back in the 60s, I mean, cars that I drove, <coughs> even like an Indy Lights car, technically by that time, 
um, is faster than the Formula One car that he drove. Yeah. So the technology kept growing and growing. That doesn't mean um, th that wasn't the highest performance back then. Matter of fact, it was more dangerous. We all know that. But um, you know, the other thing is, I think you know, it would be one of those moments that uh, for him to you know be there and be around and see all this stuff. I think you'd be amazed because he was just doing something that was in the moment, right? You, you know, and, and I know speaking to my dad about these things, he would just tell them that, oh, I, I yeah, I raced at this race and we finished third at the, the, the GT40, but it is history. And now we look back at it and it's such a big deal. It's such, you know, it's such foundation for where racing has become. So for sure, he was a humble man, but in, you know, was focused on, on his racing and loved it with a passion. Um, and I think he would be kind of amazed at the, how, how much history it really became. Yeah. How much history? It became the whole, the yeah. whole, you know, uh, the whole story, right? It really was just for him. And he, I'm not going to say it was just another race because it was the 24 hours of Le Mans, but for what it's become to be such a big, huge, um, factor in, in in and where Ford is is has gone from there and and what it did for Ford at that moment in time yeah I think you would be amazed by it last time I raced was in 2012 last time I raced the 24 hours of Daytona was 2009 I was reflecting on that if I always say it's like five years ago but I've been saying five years for apparently over 10 years now <laughs> so um, yeah we I raced here um, uh, the last time in a in a GT car in 2009. Would you like to have a go in the new, in the last GT race car? I mean, just a few laps, just say you did it. Yeah, I would actually, I would, I would love to. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I'll, let me actually say that. <clears throat> I wouldn't in a, ra in a race, uh, uh, you know, I when I retired in 2012, um, and I, the only, I lost the, the desire to compete. I, I didn't know that would actually happen to me. I, I truly love racing. I truly love competing in racing. Now I do love driving cars on tracks. I love the art of driving cars. I love the whole education and the, the, the skills it takes to, to drive cars. Competing, um, other than helping my son, who is now third generation, Spencer Bucknam, um, helping him with his racing career, don't really have a desire to race. So, yeah, to drive it though, absolutely. I love driving cars on racetracks. I think I understand what you're asking. Um, Yeah. From the racing wall. Yeah. What is the most thing that you can say? <sighs> wow, there's a, yeah, I think it's um, <clears throat> especially racing to have, and I was fortunate enough to have a, a more than two decades of professional racing in my, my background, what was to never give up. Because it is, I had one year that I didn't race during that time, and it was the hardest year for me, is being not with a, a, a ride to go uh, to drive. And it's so many of my friends that started racing with me, it's so difficult between finding sponsorships, finding good teams, being, being able to stay in a race car, and getting paid is, is way more difficult than people think. But I told myself, the quickest way to failure is quitting. And so I continued and it, it paid off, um, you know, and, and just to reflect on that, my dad, of course, my dad was a racing driver professional, but he passed away before I started racing professionally. He was around when I raced go-karts <clears throat> and he passed away just as I was starting to race cars. So I felt as he passed away, sort of lost on how to do it. But the great thing was he was friends with people like Dan Gurney and Carol Shelby and Skip Barber and all these, and Bob Bondurant and, and people. And they were so gracious to tell me, your dad was amazing as a driver, you need to keep doing it. So yeah, never give up, yep. Mm. 
we, yeah, so to answer your question, um, <clears throat> the, there was a core group of about seven guys that did the majority of the driving, and it really was, um, we had a few particular cars that we drove on a regular basis, but we sort of, you know, musical chairs, we would get in different cars. So my, our roles were not really specific. They were, we were the core group that just drove most of the cars. So um, other than specifically driving my dad's car, sometimes I even got in the, uh, the Dan Gurney car. Um, once because Alex was doing something else, Alex Gurney who drove his dad's car, he was gone so I'd jump in that car. Uh, the Bandini car was driven mostly by this guy Kelly Collins, but he was off doing something so that I drove that car. So it was really, we all helped and shared. And I think there was a time Derek Hill had to get in my dad's car because I was doing another uh, part of a, the, the driving. And the unique part of that was the, the Porsches with the long tail and, and, and a couple of the other ones. The, they were built by, I don't know what company, but the cockpit was so small, it was me and a few other guys that could only fit inside those. So, like Derek Hill is like 6'2 or something, and you know, I'm only 5'8". So, uh, there was a scene where I had to drive the Porsche and, and he drove my dad's car because we, he just flat out couldn't get in the, the Porsche. So, um, yeah, so it was great because we, there was no, we all have egos, especially in, in racing drivers and things, but we were, that group got along so well we just shared the driving um, stuff with and especially with having Robert Nagel as our, our lead uh, stunt coordinator he was the greatest so he put us at ease at driving all the different cars so yeah we all we all did did it together how many days did it take to, to film what's that how many days did it take to, to film the, the uh, if I remember correctly, I mean over I think it was about almost five months but it was uh, I think I did. 50 days, 45 days, something like that. That would include a little bit of downtime or setup and stuff like that. But if we did, I would say we did like 40 days of driving. That, I'm not positive on that, but it's it was 40, 50 days. Yeah. Uh, it is, it is, yeah. I mean, I. So in, so in racing, it's feast or famine. You either are bringing sponsors and you're, you know, um, or if you make it to, you know, the top levels of prototype racing or I raced Indy cars as well, that's, that's the feast. You get paid super good. Um, for sure, the film industry is, there's a core group of guys that do most of it and they make million, millions of dollars. So yeah, it pays super well. And from what I hear, the residual money on the backside of the movie is going to be good. I haven't gotten that yet, but uh, I'll let you know. Yeah, right. Well, actually, it's funny. I heard that um, that the speaking lines pays more, but not technically it does not. Yeah, because Ben Collins, who the Stig, do you guys know the Stig? Yeah. So he he did uh, played. Um, I forget which driver. Sorry for the moment, but. They asked him to step in and they do a speaking role and whatever the contract signs, you sign it and that's your thing. So it doesn't necessarily pay more. Even like Alex had a couple lines in the movie. So it pays, it can pay a little bit more, but it's not like a lot more unless you're a main actor and you've cut a deal for millions or whatever it is. But um, with that said, we all got paid quite nicely. Right. Obviously, um, I, I feel personally like that, that mission is changing a little bit. You know, there's some brands out here that may not even have a much of an offering. Yeah. You sell on Monday, it's more of a branding exercise. Not only for a jersey. Um, but, you know, it's like you get a move the needle on a Miata. <laughs> right, you know, right. Um, you know, how do you see that that has changed? Because back then, it was, you know, really big. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and I think the the reason for that is that it, you know back then technology hadn't maxed out itself yet. We now see in motor racing that it, there's complete restrictions on technology, right? They're trying to reduce the all the things that you can do to a race car, but for all the computer aided situations, active suspension, you know, all these traction control, all the um, different things. So I think that's why there's not nearly as much, at least visible, 
perform, uh, development in cars anymore. I mean, you would literally see a car show up at a racetrack that looks so much different than a different race car back in the day just by having, say, a wing on the car, right? Now it's a, now everybody knows a wing works, right? But there's like someone had to think of that or, you know, different suspension pieces or flat, a, a tire that was wider. It's like, oh, wow, this actually has more grip than a tire that's narrower. So. Um, so I think that really translated into manufacturers building better cars on the street that people could see, use, and, and even be safer. But no, I think um, now what we're going to see is, you know, things being uh, from the electric cars to all that development does sort of help. But I still think at the end of the day it's going to be, um, you know, companies that use racing as a platform to advance their businesses because it's it's such an exciting thing whether they take somebody to uh, you know out on a, a trip somewhere to maybe do a deal to get things to work i think the racetrack is where you're going to see you know big companies come sponsor cars and use that as the platform to move forward and it's still the 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 the, the car industry it could be anything from tire manufacturers to actual you know manufacturers that make cars doing yeah it's 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 <clears throat> it's a tricky it's a very tight group of guys even though you know I know most of them as friends um, they they uh, uh, are very uh, it's very hard industry to still even get into uh, so I I've done a few things since the movie I've done a couple of commercials um, but uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of older now on the backside of doing a career. Uh, I, I do enjoy it and I would like to do more of it, but I would not say it's not going to be something that I try to reinvent myself and become a stunt driver for from here on out. If I could do a movie a year or something like that or a few commercials, I think that would be great. Yeah. Does it require very different skills <clears throat> than from racing? To do the stunt driving? Yeah. Not at all. Um, the only difference is just understanding from the filming aspect what they're trying to get because there's sometimes you're not even in the shot and sometimes you are and sometimes you repeat the same uh, shot six times not because you got it wrong but they're getting it from a different angle so you then you have to repeat it exactly right because you get the shot and then they say okay we're going to repeat it from this angle well you can't be on this side of the car when you were on that side the last time so driving though super simple because that's our that's our that's what we do like literally driving the car up to the limits under braking and turning and being side by side feels as natural as you know driving on the highway by yourself it's 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 simple even though you're at a hundred and something miles an hour it's just what we do but uh, no as far as the the whole hardest part is just knowing where they want you and what what you're supposed to be doing from each each picture they're trying to do or each shot they're trying to get which isn't too difficult as long as you have a guy like uh, uh, Robert Nagel, who's the stunt coordinator. He was great. He told us where to be. <clears throat> yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, so mostly uh, Christian Bale was there more often because he was playing a, dri a racing driver. Um, yeah, we shared the same makeup room where we'd get ready and, and, and things. Um, very good, normal guys in that scenario. Um, I think actually fairly humble, actually, because they had uh, a respect for, for what it took to do the driving. Because even Matt Damon did a little bit of driving cause when he, at the beginning of the scene where he was uh, at Le Mans and he caught fire. So he had to do some of the driving when he pulled up to pit lane before he got out of the car and caught fire. So I did that scene with him um, as the other cars. And uh, so, yeah, uh, we, we spent a little time, but most of it, and I was saying it earlier, we, we were mostly in the cars with radios, uh, with our stunt coordinator telling us what to do while a lot of the acting that was going on, say in pit lane. Um, so we didn't really interact with them as much because we were just driving the cars. Yeah, but super, super great. One more? Yeah, I, I saw the movie in November with my 84-year-old uncle and a couple of his cronies, and my uncle hadn't even been in a theater in five years, but but they were rocking during the action scenes, you know, it was yeah. visceral. Yeah. And I wonder if while you were making the, 
those scenes you had any inkling that they would come off so well? Do you be, have that kind of view? Yeah, actually, no. We were well. We hoped so. Yeah. I remember having many conversations with the stunt guys talking about you know we're hoping this comes out on the big screen as well as we think it's coming out when you're driving it. You just uh, you know har it's so hard to tell. And some of the stuff inevitably we we shot a little slower through some of the corners because they were tight, so they were technically slower, and we weren't sure how, it always looks slower than you think it's gonna be. So, you know, even when you look out here on the front straightaway at the Daytona, I was just telling people how fast do you think those cars are going. They're doing about 180 to 190 miles an hour, and it looks like it's going maybe 100. So it's 190 miles an hour when you look out there. It's much faster than you think. Okay, so me and Robert. Robert. Okay, thanks guys. You know, I got five laps in a passenger seat of an LM in like a GT40 here. Yeah? 